I'm Peter Martin. And I'm Adam Annis. Welcome to the You'll Hear It podcast. Today, we're going to talk about how you can become a better composer. And if this works out well, we're going to talk about how we can become better composers as well. We're always growing, always learning. Right, Adam? That's right, man. I'm going to be out of this jazz thing. I'm going to be a professional composer. <laughs> I'll see you all later. And, well, that's, you bring up a good point because I think all jazz musicians kind of think about themselves and should think about themselves as composers because we do a lot of improvisation. Um, but I think it's a, an interesting thing to think about. A lot of you guys are interested in, in composing. And Adam, I know you've done a lot of great composing and arranging, and I've done a little bit. Um, but it's fun as jazz musicians to think about how the improv that we always do informs our composition and maybe vice versa. Yeah, I think uh, jazz musicians have a huge advantage in composing because we compose all the time. Right. We totally understand how to do it, and it's right. It should be right at our fingertips as players. Absolutely. Okay, so the first thing I think about always with this is from the great Ray Brown, who's a bassist, of course, uh, who needs no introduction, but in case we got any ignorant folks out there, mm. go, go Google him. Mm. But Ray Brown, you know, just, just one of the greatest jazz bassists ever. But I had a, a, a little bit of a chance to play with him and be around him, and I'm, I'm so, so grateful that I had that. Uh, but I remember him talking about um, you know, how you become a better composer. And his thing was compose every day. It wasn't like, you know, study Duke Ellington scores, which maybe we'll talk about that, but it was just compose every day. And it really got me thinking that, you know, you have to do it in order to develop. And composition is such a personal thing that you're getting into an area like improvisation that there's only so far somebody else can tell you what to do because you have to have it personalized. So, yes, there's things that you can learn and you can study and you can learn form and harmony and all these different things, which are great. But if you're not composing every day, are you really a composer? I don't even know. Yeah, you should, you should definitely include it in your regular routine as you would any other part of your practice. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, this, I think people get caught up like, well, I have to compose this big thing and it's going to take all this time. Just compose four bars every day. Exactly. You compose four bars every day, you're going to have a bunch of tunes in about a month. Right. And you I mean, if I mean? you want to write, you know, and I remember doing this, it was like I wanted to write a, a blues because I thought that would be easy. And I kept writing these tunes and they were so corny. Yeah. Um, but I kept, I was just, you know, like, I want to have my own tunes. And finally, I kind of stumbled upon something that, that was okay, but it was going through that process. You got to get through a lot of crap before you get to the promised land. Well, I don't know about, I, you might have been, been different, but my first, I don't know, 150 improvised solos were terrible. And it's the same thing with composing. You have to write some bad stuff before you figure out how to write some good stuff. That's it's, right. There's no right. getting around that. And I think it's just the whole concept, too, of... How do you know what's good and bad for yourself until you actually do it? You almost have to do that. You know, it's like, how do you learn what hot and cold is? You're little and you go by your mom or your dad and, and they're like, don't touch the stove, it's hot. But you don't know what hot means and then you touch it and then you're like, oh, that's what hot is. You Definitely. Know? Well, and so another way to get better is our second point, and that's to study scores. So there's, a, there's an amazing wealth of knowledge available to you. There's a great website. It's a free nonprofit website called IMSLP. IMSLP.org, and they have a ton of free scores you can check out. It's an awesome organization. Beethoven and Mozart and just every classical composer you can think of up until copyright stuff starts coming in, which is 20th century. But all of the great scores you can study, and then you can go on YouTube or Spotify and, and follow along with the music to this score, and you are going to see some things that you're not hearing. And it's pretty cool because... You know, there's, I, just, I just was uh, orchestrating this, this thing that involved Prokofiev's score for Romeo and Juliet, and there's this rumble that was happening, and I was like, what the, how is he getting that sound? It turns out he's putting, like, these dissonant triads in the low brass, and it doesn't make any sense, but it creates this rumble, and you're like, well, now I know how to create this rumble. It's, it's by that. And I wouldn't have known that without uh, looking up the score and seeing what Prokofiev was doing. Do it with jazz musicians, too. Duke Ellington scores are available online. Check out Thelonious Monk's uh, charts. You know, there's Art Blakey charts available to check out. Um, you know, we're so lucky now with the internet to have all these resources available pretty yeah. much instantly. And you can, there's no excuse not to see how these great composers and arrangers 
uh, you know, orchestrated things and composed things. Yeah, and I mean, the, you know, s some of the giants you mentioned, Duke Ellington, Monk, but one you mentioned, Art Blakey, I think that's so important, and maybe we're even thinking like Wayne Shorter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, arrangements to, to, to look at those scores and listen to those along. I mean, there's such, especially for that style of Absolutely. writing for three horns, is, there's a wealth of great things. Thad there. Jones, I mean, the list goes on and on. Right. Um, you know, next I'm thinking just, let, let, let's really make sure that if you're a jazz musician out there, and you, you want to work on composing, you know, draw, you have such an advantage, we have such an advantage in that we're constantly composing as we improvise. So start with that. If you're sitting down to, to write and you're going to commit to compose every day, you know, there shouldn't really be the, the stage of the tortured artist sitting at the typewriter, a blank page, and then going and having to drink a fifth of Jack Daniels because you can't even get one word out. I mean, you know, every time you get on the stage, you have to play something. So maybe you just have to be forced into playing in real time and just say, okay, this is the form I'm going to choose. I'm going to, I don't have any ideas today, so I'm going to write a, something over rhythm changes and just play for a course, put together a simple improvisation, record yourself, and then transcribe it. Now you're composing, you know? And then you'll be able to take that and extend it from there. But basically, we're taking and applying our improvisational skills as jazz musicians to compositions. That's right. And you know, for jazz composition, you can transcribe tunes of great composers. Transcribe tunes by Monk, transcribe tunes mm. by Coltrane, transcribe tunes by Bill Evans and Wayne Shorter. I mean, transcribed tunes by people that you love, by Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. These are amazing compositions. And then once you transcribe the melody and the chord changes and, and, and it's right and you, you can play it and you can hear it and you, you know what it is, start analyzing those transcriptions. Yes. You know, when you transcribe Herbie Hancock's Dolphin Dance and you can see how he moves this melody and these rhythmic devices around, these amazing chord changes and how he changes keys, it's a pretty great lesson in jazz composition. Yes, so I'm, I'm thinking even the difference between studying a score, like a lot of you might say, well, you already said study the score, so I don't have to transcribe. But if you transcribe the composition, and you know, generally this is a lot easier than transcribing a solo, so that it's not going to take you as long, it's not as arduous as the process. But if you, the, the, the going through it phrase by phrase, chord by chord, like what you develop with your ears is so great, and also, your understanding of the actual construction of the composition will be at such a deeper level than just looking at the scores when someone else has done the work for you. I would just caution you to really heed that part of it. Even though it just seems easier, everything's available to us. Now, you don't have to do this on every song, I mean, because you're going to get stuck and bogged down by doing that. But try to commit to at least, you know, every couple of weeks really getting a transcription uh, project going because you really will be rewarded from that work. Yeah, and you know what? If you're feeling a little discouraged from transcribing, you know what you could tell yourself? What? You'll hear it. I like it. Hey. That's it for today's episode of the You'll Hear It podcast. For more information or to hear more of these podcasts, go to openstudionetwork.com slash podcast.